Mr. Tapper grew up in Queen Village. I don't know if you knew that. So he's standing right in back of me. Join me in welcoming him back to Philadelphia. So let me tell you just a little bit about the book, which probably all of you already know. Uh, this is the third in a series of um, books that he's written about Charlie and Margaret Martyr and their family. The book that we're going to talk about this evening, All the Demons Are Here, uh, follows the now grown martyr children through the crazy decade of the 70s. So I know we all feel we're living in a little bit of crazy right now, but as we read back and, and kind of revisit some of the highlights of that decade, whether it was um, tabloid journalism, the cults that were so big in the news um, at that time, um, Evil Knievel, who has a big role in this book, which cracks me up, um, Son of Sam, not as funny, but also memorable. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we were kind of living with day to day during the 70s um, are fondly kind of brought back into our consciousness and our lives as we read the story about the martyr kids as adults, and I think you'll enjoy it um, as much as I know that I did. And so joining Jake on stage, the one guy in Philadelphia who's probably been in everyone's living room at one time or another, right? Jim Gardner, uh, a local celebrity for sure. We all know who he is. Um, on 6ABC Action News for years. Um, and just really such a delight and an honor to have him with us this evening as well. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jake and Jim. Okay, how many people here are from my synagogue? <laughs> okay. My mom's over there. Hi, mom. Are you serious? <laughs> That's my mom. Is that right? The synagogue stuff Nice now. to meet you. So two guys from your living room. Here we go. Tapper, you sold out, you sold out the house. <laughs> and these are, uh, these, are Phil these are Philly's uh, sneakers. I just want to make sure I have one. Last worn on Seth Meyers' show in October and, uh, and then thrown in the closet angrily after that. You made me feel overdressed, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Um, I mean, if I can just say, I'm sorry to interrupt Jim, but like eight-year-old me cannot believe this. <laughs> My mom knows. Eight-year-old me cannot believe this. Okay, sorry. So we're going to take this opportunity to uh, talk about the book uh, and also some other things, if that's okay with of you. Of course. Yeah. Um, today, by the way, is, it's my understanding, the date of publication. Yep, pub date today. For all the demons In Philly. are here. Yep. <clears throat> so my question is, this is the sixth time you have experienced a publication date. Yeah. Um, is it still a thrill or is it old hat by now? It, it's, uh, it's a thrill and it's, uh, it's, nerve, it's nerve wracking. It's always nerve wracking anytime you put anything out into the world uh, and, um, and hope people like it and hope people uh, respond to it. Um, it, is, it is a thrill. I definitely find myself, and I apologize to anybody who follows me on social media, uh, doing a lot more selling of the book than uh, I thought was part of being an author when I was growing up. Um, because, uh, first of all, the writer's strike has meant that all the late night shows are canceled. Uh, and so I, by now I would have been on Kimmel and Colbert and been looking forward to Seth Meyers. And uh, I don't get to speak to their audiences uh, of millions of people uh, to sell the book and get people to read it. Um, but then also just the way that the life of an author is these days. It's like uh, being a door-to-door -door encyclopedia salesman in the 50s, it feels like sometimes. But so I apologize to anybody I'm, you know, overwhelming with my book promotions. I promise it will stop, especially if you buy one. <laughs> so one of his strategies, and, and we haven't talked about this, is to send the book to well-known people and then have them take pictures of themselves reading the book, send the pictures back to Jake so that he can then use them on social media. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, 
That's, Pretty clever, right? That's very cool. <laughs> you sent me the book, but you didn't ask me to take a picture. Well, I was already asking you to do this. I mean, okay. I assume okay. you're going to do a book thing after, but like this, <laughs> this is a big ask. He's not getting paid for this. I mean, this is just like Jim Gardner out of the goodness of his heart agreeing to read the book. And then, of course, because he's Jim Gardner, he finishes the third book in the series, the new one, and then goes back and reads the first two. And then he's lost in those two worlds, so then he goes back and rereads the third book. Because this, this is, is all true. This is a diligent, this is all true. A, a diligent man. It was, this it is was Saturday afternoon when, when, when it occurred to me, you know, I've, I've, the devil may dance and hellfire and, and I had all this Jake Tapper stuff swirling around my head and I kind of forgot <laughs> <laughs> what's going on in here. So late Saturday night, I said, I got to read this book, you know, again for the second time. And it was a race to the finish. Yeah. I knew and I get paid tonight. twice when that happens. I, <laughs> I get... <laughs> So, um, before I started to read what I now refer to as the Tapper Canon. <laughs> nice. Um, the, the, and that's the first time anyone has ever said that, <laughs> the Tapper Canon. Okay. My favorite historical fiction, work of historical fiction was Gore Vidal's Lincoln. Oh, yeah. He's such a beautiful a author. Yeah. Great, great, brilliant work. Um, but you have taken it upon yourself to be uh, one of the best-known contemporary authors of historical fiction. Well, thank you. That's very what, nice to hear. What is it about that genre that has appealed to you? Um, I mean, I'm, I love history, and I love uh, historical fiction myself. Um, I think the first one I remember reading was Caleb Carr's The Alienist, which has uh, Ted, Teddy Roosevelt as like a young police detective in New York City. And, um, and I thought it would be fun. And the first time I, uh, I did it, the first time I sat down and tried to do it, I tried to do it about colonial Philadelphia. Uh, and it was, that's, that was too much for me as a first time author to, to pull off. I couldn't get through the first chapter. But the idea of playing with an era seemed really interesting. And then it hit me that I had never really read any good historical fiction, especially a thriller that took place in the, in the McCarthy era of the 1950s. And so I read a lot about that era and I did a first draft of the Hellfire Club, and then I realized after I'd done the first draft I, I, that I needed to get more comfortable with playing with the, the historical characters. I needed, and I, and I, there were some historical, um, there were some fictional characters in the first draft that I just threw out, and I put Joe McCarthy and Roy Cohn in those scenes and made it so much better, and then I just realized this is fun. And then, so the next one was Sinatra and the Rat Pack for The Devil May Dance, and then this one, um, Evil Knievel and Elvis Presley and the rest. And we will get into this uh, in some detail, uh, I hope, uh, I assume. Um, so, we were introduced to Charlie Martyr, and, uh, who was a, a Columbia professor who, by accident, more or less, found himself to be uh, a member of, of Congress, and his wife, Margaret, in the Hellfire Club, when Eisenhower was president and when Joe McCarthy was terrorizing the political landscape. 25 literary years later, um, we are focusing more on their children, yeah. their daughter Lucy, and their son, who is a, an aspiring journalist, mm -hmm. and their son Ike. So tell us about these two and how they got involved with a serial killer and, as you say, evil Knievel. <laughs> so, um, Margaret in the first book is, is pregnant, uh, and, then, uh, and that is with Lucy, although she remains pregnant when the book is over. And I had her pregnant because, well, first of all, I'd wanted to have the main couple, the main protagonists be a married couple because I'd read so many thrillers, and this is not to knock them, but it was always about a single man, you know, romancing his way through his adventure, which, again, I read those books all the time, but that's not really a world I know, at least not anymore. And so I have a happy marriage with a very strong woman. And I thought, well, this isn't, you know, I, maybe I could make it about a, a married husband and wife. I hadn't really read anything like that other than, you know, uh, Nick and Nora in the Thin Man books, which dates back a few years. So, so I thought making them a family would be important. And then after the first book, where I had not just the plot and everything, but I had their marriage have an arc, and then again in The Devil May Dance, I had their marriage have an arc. And Charlie and Margaret kind of just leave their kids behind in The Devil May Dance. Right. They're kind of just, we kind of just pretend. <laughs> we pretend, so, pretend. Someone's taking care yeah, of them. Yeah, the mother. Back of, east. Yeah, yeah back exactly. in the kids. They're not really, a, they're not really in there. Um, 
And then uh, I thought it would be interesting just to continue to play with the family uh, and also just to create two new characters and, to, and have two young characters because my characters um, age with the years. Uh, they're not always you know, perpetually 35 like a lot of fictional characters are. And uh, so Ike is um, an AWOL Marine uh, who's been involved in a, an American misadventure, a U.S. Marine's misadventure in Lebanon and is kind of disgusted with the government and the Pentagon lying to the American people and so goes AWOL, and he ends up on Evil Knievel's pit crew, uh, and, and he's in Montana, and that, ended, that was a way for me to, A, have fun with just writing about a different world, like the Wild West in 1977, uh, and Evil Knievel, who was, uh, looks like people in this crowd might remember Evil Knievel, he was a pretty, well, I mean, I say it to my staff, and they have no idea what I'm talking about, it, but, but, but then, that's also the reaction when I tell them about the Iraq War. Um, <laughs> So, the, they're just young, that's all. So, so um, but, but, and then it, Ike's story allows me to get into the story of A, he's disillusioned, which is, I think, a, a big feeling that uh, was prominent in the 70s because of Watergate, because of, um, because of the Vietnam War, and also a feeling that I, I kind of feel like we're all feeling a bit today, disillusionment with power and, and the rest. It also allowed me to introduce Evil Knievel as a character, which was a lot of fun because he's a, a stuntman, hugely famous, and just a horrible person. Um, just awful. Uh, Sinatra was a much more nuanced character. He had his good side and his bad side, and Evil Knievel was pretty much all bad. Um, Lucy is an aspiring journalist, and she gets swept up. Uh, she works in, she's working for the Washington Star, and she gets swept up and hired by a competing newspaper, which is fictional, called the Washington Sentinel, which is a tabloid. Never actually existed, but the family is, is you know, loosely, uh, and by that I mean directly, based on <laughs> Rupert Murdoch and his family, and they are, yeah, I know, that's, he's not a good guy, uh, and, and, uh, and Rupert Murdoch, the Lyon family is what they're called, L-Y-O-N, uh, <laughs> just, just to be clear. Uh, and the, the Lyon family is introdu introducing a tabloid in Washington, D.C. in 1977, and this mirrors what was actually going on in American journalism in 1977, which was the prominence, the rise of the New York Post, uh, the, New York, uh, the New York Daily News, and the, and the Murdoch Empire. Um, and so people talk, well, was I inspired by Succession? I'm like, no, no, no. Succession was inspired by Murdoch uh, in his later years, and I'm, I'm inspired by Murdoch in his, in his early years when he was getting a toehold and preceding his frontal attack on truth and journalism. Um, and so Lucy gets assigned to cover a serial killer in Washington, D.C., and um, follows the path that tabloid journalism inevitably always leads to. Expand on that. I mean, she, she no, no, no. She, I mean, she is an idealistic woman, young woman, who comes in with a Yale pedigree, and she wants to be Carl Bernstein and, and Bob Woodward, and as you say, William Sapphire is, you know, her ideal, but they want her to be Jimmy Breslin. They and want her to be Jimmy Breslin, which is, the, which is probably the best case scenario for any tabloid writer, because Jimmy Breslin was, you know, there, there are respected people who come from tabloid journalism, especially the New York Daily News, um, but they want to sell papers. That, that's all that they care. They want her to sell papers. They see what Murdoch and... Uh, and, then, and the New York Daily News are achieving in New York with circulation and uh, newsstand uh, sales going through the roof because all of New York City is terrified of the Son of Sam killer. Terrified. Which, by the way, I did not learn about the Son, son of Sam until... M Thank you for keeping that from me when I was eight years old, <laughs> Mom. I, ima I imagine that was a pretty big subject of conversation with you and Dad, and like, uh, thank you for... I did not even know it existed, so I appreciate that. Um, but they want to sell papers, and that's their main priority, selling newspapers. Uh, and so she will submit copy that is real and based on her journalism. And you're right, she worships Woodward and Bernstein, who are characters in the book also. They appear at the beginning of the book and also at the end. Uh, and I showed it to them ahead of time, don't worry. Um, and the editors take her copy, they take her reporting, and they do things to it to goose it, to make it and better. Write, and write these salacious headlines. And salacious headlines, which is, and Maggie Haberman inter, uh, interviewed me yesterday 
uh, in New York at the 92nd Street Y, and she, in addition to being a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, writer for the New York Times, uh, used to write for both the New York Daily News and the New York Post, and she asked me, like, where did you, like, she thought that I had talked to people to figure out, like, how is it that editors at tabloids corrupt this stuff? Like, did you talk to somebody? Did you, like, you know, did, did, how did you learn that that's what they do? And I just, I've always had, almost always had good editors, and so I just figured, well, I remember, like, handing in copy and then making it better, and, you know, better journalism, and I just see what happens at Fox and the New York Post, and I just, it's not that difficult to imagine handing in good journalism, having people make it worse. So one of the compelling plot lines at this juncture of the story for me was um, Max Lyons, who owns the newspaper and, and is the executive editor, if you will, um, exploits America's struggle with um, racial justice and the racial divide to sell papers yeah. in terms of uh, coming up with this highly embellished notion that a, an African-American male might be the serial killer. Could you explain that plot line and, and, and why it's so significant? It's significant because that's what... Uh, so a lo there are lines in the book, and there's an acknowledgement section at the end of the book. Um, so just flash like with my two previous books, so you can figure. So if you're wondering what's real and what's not real, you can go back there and see what's real and what's not real. But there are lines that I gave to Max Lyon that are directly from Rupert Murdoch. Uh, the idea that news consumption is based on two emotions: fear and rage. That's a quote. That's not people projecting that on him. He has said that: fear and rage. And so, you know, 1977, um, racial tensions were worse than they are today, as bad as they might be today. And um, it just seemed like that would be something that would, A, sell papers, and B, based on how Murdoch and his enterprises um, cover everything, something that they would want to lean into. I mean, if you look at how they cover immigration, uh, or, I mean, any number, you know, elections. Uh, there's any number of ways that they want to lean in to create bad guys and, um, and demonize people so as to sell papers or get clicks or, or viewers. Do you think it's a fair question to ask whether upon reading this, one wonders, or, or, or if it's an appropriate thought, to wonder whether uh, substantial portions of the news media, uh, television news media, mm -hmm. more than print, I think, uh, is uh, guilty of um, uh, reinforcing racial stereotypes, particularly when it comes to African American males and crime. I think I think it is. A, it's a big part uh, um, of. Well, look, I think when it comes to covering news in general, the media has gotten better when it comes to a lot of these issues than it used to be. Uh, that's not to say perfect, uh, but better. Uh, and I think that people are much better in terms, news peop, most news organizations, I think, seem to understand the need to not antagonize, while also the need to provide fair and truthful coverage. Um, but I think that there, so I think things are much better now than they, than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 1977 for sure. Um, I do think that, you know, words have consequences and, and, and reporting has consequences and bad reporting has consequences and that, um, you know, it, I was, uh, thinking about this the other day because somebody was asking me not about the racial component of this but the idea of not to not to ruin the plot of the book but the the the, the sensationalism uh in the book has uh in lucy's in lucy's reporting as twisted by her editors uh ends up having very serious ramifications i don't want to say it between more than that because i want you to read the book um, but I was, uh, I was thinking about the idea of, of 
how much do I think about ramifications when I report something? And um, I think about it a lot. Do I think about it enough? Prob probably not, but I do think about it a lot. And then I was thinking about um, after the Boston ma Marathon bombing, uh, I went up to, I'd only been at CNN for a month, and we went up to Boston and we were reporting it. And I don't know how many of you remember this. This is 2013, April 2013. But it was an era when all of these amateur sleuths were online. And there were all these photographs of the scene, and all these people were on all sorts of chat boards and trying to figure out if the culprits, who were at that point unknown, um, were there, if they could spot them. And I remember um, doing a story that we didn't air about people doing this sleuthing. And we didn't air it because it was there was no way to tell the story without showing these images, and we had no idea that what they were looking into was accurate. But then that same week, uh, boy, I'm really picking on the Murdochs, but, but um, the New York Post had a front page where they had like two young men, an image of two young men with backpacks. Surprise, surprise, they weren't white and, uh, in, this, in this picture, and they were pointing, the New York Post was basically saying, are these the guys? And they later had to, had to pay them a big cash settlement because they were not. They were just two Massachusetts residents. Um, it wasn't a $787.5 million uh, settlement, <laughs> but it was a big settlement, I assume. And I thought about, God, what must it have been like to be, to be those guys? Um, you know, four days, weeks. It must have just been awful. Um, Another th issue that you... That you raise either purposefully or not. Um, you have Lucy Martyr, who comes in again as a thoroughly idealistic young journalist. And um, while the culture and the individuals at the Sentinel are juicing her copy mm -hmm. and truly distorting it with headlines that really don't even speak to what she has written, she stays. Yeah. Uh, she stays, why? Because of front page stardom? Because of all the praise that is heaped upon her? And my question is, when people, all of us, watch and read reporting from, uh, from journalists, and, and I think this probably applies more to uh, television journalism than not, although not, not necessarily. Is there a reason ever to question whether said journalist has been compromised by temptation of money or stardom within the star system of cable news and network news? Uh, I'm sure it's happened, Yeah. but, but does it happen frequently? I mean, it depends upon the organization, honestly. I mean, most journalists I know are, are TV included, are good, decent people who want to make a difference and want to be good reporters, and I'm sure that's the same for you. But have there been people I know who I don't recognize them anymore because of the swan song, because of the temptation, the siren song of, of money and power? Yeah, of, of, of course. I mean, I can't say that that's why they did such and such a thing. Lucy stays at the Sentinel because she had been at the Washington Star and she was a young woman journalist who was not taken seriously and she kept breaking stories and the editors kept taking them from her and giving them to male reporters to put under their bylines. And she's sick of it. Uh, and then so she leaves the Star and she's enticed and by uh, this, this lovely, gorgeous family from the UK. Uh, and, um, you know, the oldest son is really handsome and the daughter is really pretty and charming and they want to try to do something new and all of a sudden she's writing for them and the editor, her old editor doesn't put up a fuss, doesn't even know her name. And, I mean, there's a conversation in there about what she thinks about leaving, but, like, she's 22. She, you know, there aren't that many jobs out there for journalists and, you know, who's going to hire her after she's left the Star and the Sentinel? What's she going to do next? And she's a star reporter for them. They're making her a star reporter. They're treating her like Maggie Haberman. I yeah, mean, they're treating her like Maggie Haberman and, and they're coming up with ways to, to 
give her, you know, Lucy Martyr scoops and uh, is a, like a label that they're doing. And so there is this enticement, but she does feel, she does feel torn about it. Um, but I, I think that uh, there, she, she feels bad about it, but I think that there are probably a lot of people that, not a lot, but I'm sure there are people who go through a situation like that and feel no compunction uh, about it at all. And I, I've definitely... I've definitely seen some of that. Um, you have? Yeah, I think so. Not at CNN, but uh, in, in my career, I've seen it. And there are also really good journalists uh, at Fox, for example, who you know, would love to get out, but there isn't really a way to get out. And there are at- also some journalists or hosts at Fox. <clears throat> no, I shouldn't even talk about that. <laughs> Well, you can just say journalists and, and hosts at some places, and, no, and who, nobody will you know, think who, that you're talking who, about Fox. Whom we, know, whom we know didn't believe right. that the election was stolen because of the Dominion lawsuit, but continued to say so on the and air. It's remarkable. Now, why would they do that? Because they, were, was the because they wanted to maintain their power and their money, and they were being told very clearly by their bosses, and they didn't even really need to be told that their audience wanted them to lie to them about the election. And that's what comes out in all of those texts, with the exception of Maria Bartiromo, who seemed to actually <clears throat> believe what the ghost whisperer was telling her, uh, that all of them seemed to be... Even Donald Trump Jr. was like begging for his father, who he couldn't reach, interestingly, um, uh, to like call off the dogs on January 6th. I mean... So, yeah, there is, a, there is a big degree to which we saw this in the Dominion lawsuit, although obviously, um, you know, this book was written before right. those emails right. came out. And despite what was just said, nobody stood up and walked out, which is great. Um, so, um, <laughs> but there's a real, but, I mean, but there's some people considering it. I, 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 I mean, this is a real threat to uh, the nation. I mean, the book, I hope, is, is a fun read and an enjoyable read, but the idea of there being, I mean, the, spoiler alert, the good guys win, but, but, uh, but that's not to say that there's accountability or justice either in my book. But like, this is a serious threat when 40% of the country believes something that is just abjectly false and were, was adjudicated in courtroom after courtroom after courtroom, including right here in Philadelphia, uh, and 40% of the country just believes a lie because not just uh, political figures, but news media figures uh, tell them that. It's, it's, a real, it's a real threat, and, and uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but it's the American experiment. It's not proven to work. It's an experiment. We're seeing if this can work, and it only really works if people uh, are trying to operate in good faith on these debates. We're sliding into an area here. Uh, No, 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 because I want to continue. Um, (laughs) Evil Knievel. Yeah. Uh, We have to suspend our disbelief for a while in the book because he's running for president of the United States. (laughs) And he says, quote, our country is in serious trouble. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but we don't have them. Our enemies are getting stronger, and as a country, we're getting weaker. Is that supposed to remind us of somebody? Well, if you Google it, it might come up for somebody. I mean, there, were, there are lines in the book that are from actual statements. Look, it, evil can evil, um, put aside... Uh, Put, put, put aside any pejorative idea of, of, of what I'm about to say. Evil Knievel had a gift. It, w- it wasn't an athletic gift, even though he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated and featured often on ABC Wide, Neural, Wide World of Sports. It was a gift of salesmanship and showmanship, of spectacle, of confidence, of shooting from the hip, of uh, winning over fans, uh, charming people by being... Uh, a rogue, and there's a tradition of this in, in the United States, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, Jesse James or P.T. Barnum or Evil Knievel or Donald Trump. There is a tradition of people who are able to capture the imagination of the country, not necessarily based on ability, 
but based on charisma and charm and um, a certain salesmanship. And so when I was writing the book and a friend, a friend, a few friends of mine uh, really love Evil Knievel. I completely, completely, his appeal completely passed me by when I was a kid. Um, but I went back and I watched a documentary called Being Evil and he really just seemed like such a great quintessential American character, a bad guy character, but a character. And um, yeah, I mean his, uh, there was like a fake Evil Knievel for President campaign in like 72 or 76, just kind of like a shtick, you know, the way that, that you see it every four years, you'll see like, you know, uh, Jimmy Kimmel for president or something. I was gonna say Jim Gardner for president, but that's actually sounds like a good idea. Um, but, but uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, it was meant as a compliment. Um, uh, sorry, Amy, uh, uh, but, but um, yeah, I mean, I just it, it just, it didn't seem that much of a stretch, to, honestly. Now that we've been through what we've been through, it didn't seem that much of a stretch. And in fact, <clears throat> Ronald Reagan obviously had two successful terms as California governor uh, before he became president in 1980, three years after the, this book takes place, but he was well known for show business. He was well known for, um, for acting and for... M Mule train borax. Yeah, you yeah. That? for commercials and for... <laughs> The four, four, um, there was like an American theater. He'd introduce the production every night. I forget the name of it. So, I mean, the idea of, of, of uh, charismatic celebrity running for president, and he's not really, like in the book, he's, he's, it's not like a serious campaign, but it is kind of like a spectacle he's doing. Uh, it didn't seem that much of a stretch, and it became a way to talk about um, this type of character in American culture, the, the charismatic salesman who wins people over and who are the people following him? And why are they following him? Why do they believe in him? Um, and obviously the story is meant to have, uh, you know, uh, to evoke today, but it's also just about this story and these people. But to be clear, when you were writing this, he was something of a Trumpian character. A hundred percent, yes, yeah. of course, yeah. yeah. And, the, and, the, and the mob that is following him uh, in, in this book is um, made up of people who are you know, on the fringes of society, but also people who have like legitimate grievances with society. The book takes place in 77. Ike ends up at one point in the woods um, in that area between Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, camped out with a bunch of Vietnam veterans who feel very much abandoned by the United States. A couple of them have, they don't know why they have it, but they have like a mysterious cancer and we all know what it was ultimately. But the government is telling them there's nothing wrong, there's nothing. And that idea actually occurred to me, well, I wrote a book about Afghanistan called The Outpost in 2012 and I did an event in Delaware. Which, which is brilliant by the way. Thank you. And made into a movie. Made into a, a, a Rod Lurie made a great movie out of it. And um, I did an event in Delaware, and one of the public officials who came to the event told me that there, there was a camp of veterans living in the woods in Delaware that had not been able to readjust to society, and um, they were living there, and they were, you know, and that they were being survivalists, I guess, of some sort, and that made me think about the fact that there, this has happened throughout our, our lives, um, the way we treat veterans, and also veterans sometimes having a tough time adjusting. So... My only point is just not all of the people following Evil Knievel are, are bad guys. Um, in, in fact, the Vietnam veterans, I think, are portrayed fairly sympathetically. Um, but the question is, well, why, do they, why do they believe in him? What do they think he's going to do for them? Um, and he makes promises to them that are, you know, good-sounding promises. Uh, you and I only have four or five minutes left before we turn it over to the audience. Uh, so I have to ask you a little bit about, anything, CNN, yes. about CNN. Sure. Um, I, Have I, we been in the news? I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if you folks know, but uh, a gentleman by the name of Chris Lick came to uh, CNN just over a year ago to, as the New York Times described it, uh, to make CNN uh, a fair-minded voice for viewers disenchanted with the partisan scrum of cable news. Chris Lick was fired on June 7th, just about 13 months after he got there, salon.com. Where I used to work. No, 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 no. Not oh. salon. No, I'm sorry. Radon online. Radar, radar online. Radar online. Okay. You know it's coming. 
So Radar Online on July 1st. I would not believe anything in Radar Online. Just FYI. That's just, just well, FYI. And, and he's about to uh, uh, is this about emphasize me, Aaron, that. Is this about me, Aaron, and Anderson staging a coup? Let me, let me, <laughs> <laughs> let me read the uh, quote. Uh, rudderless CNN, which has just ousted semi-new boss Chris Licht, has three new sheriffs in town. <laughs> Anderson Cooper, Jake Tapper, and Aaron Burnett. Oh, boy who have taken it upon themselves to step up for the struggling network, Radar Online has learned, yeah. Anderson, Jake, and Aaron have formed an alliance and are now running CNN, <laughs> honked an insider. With the search to find a new boss in the early stages, they have all jumped in together to fill the power vacuum. The inmates have taken over the asylum. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I have two questions. Wait, well, first of all, I'm one of... I, I sent this story to Aaron and Anderson. I just go, go ahead, keep going. I have two questions. The first question is, is there any validity to no. this? Number one. Number two, how pissed off are you for having Anderson Cooper mentioned before you? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> all right. So, first of all, Anderson comes before me in all things. I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a Vanderbilt. He's beautiful. He's been a celebrity for 50 years. He's a lovely guy. I, it's, it's good for him. I, I, he, should, he should be mentioned. He comes alphabetical, I assume, is how they did that. Um, <laughs> Burnett, Cooper, Tapper, you know, sorry. Um, it's nonsense. It's very silly. And so I sent the story uh, to Aaron and Anderson at Saturday, uh, Saturday, July 1st at 8.27 p.m. I just sent the article. And as you can see, what did I write under? LOL. And um, <laughs> one of them wrote, this is creative, nice fiction writing, LOL. The other one wrote, Radar Online is the worst of the worst. And I wrote back, I'm coming for you, Cooper, exclamation, <laughs> with seven exclamation points and then an asterisk. And then if you go down at the end of the text, it says asterisk to give you a hug. <laughs> none, none of it's serious. It's all, it's all, it's all. Chris, you know, I wanted Chris. Why Lake. did he fail? I mean, it, that's uh, really the serious part of this a, question. It, I, you know, I can't really get into people's uh, leadership style and all that, but it, it, I, I will say this. I, his mission to have CNN occupy a space where we're not perceived as leaning left or right, but we're just a news organization where people are uh, welcome to come and debate uh, opinions and uh, share facts that are accurate um, and uh, not preach to a choir, not preach to a progressive choir, not preach to a conservative choir, but just share the news. That is, which is what Channel 6, what Action News was under you, and like uh, I assume still is, and um, that mission is a good mission. And I did think that uh, all of the media because Donald Trump was so effective at making, at being, at disrupting things. He was a disruptor for, bo for positive or for negative. When it came to some of it, definitely when it came to the news media, it was for negative because he made facts and truth into partisan tools. He would lie. And if you just fact checked him, oh my God, you're a liberal. And you, oh my God, you're, you're, a, you're a hack. And the, I mean, the very notion, he did this to conservative values, too, the idea that Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney are somehow, you know, f f you know hippies is, uh, <laughs> is wild, but that's, you know, he's, he's really good at, like, disrupting and knocking people off their equilibrium. Do, do I, th I, I think everybody in the media, New York Times, Washington Post, Fox, everyone got knocked off a little because it was difficult to figure out how to, how to negotiate this. Um, I thought that there were some tweaks that needed to happen to CNN, and uh, I didn't think there was some wholesale uh, revision that needed to happen. And I thought Chris's mission, as stated, was fine. And I told him that to begin with, and um, I didn't have to change anything about my show or how I did the news or anything like that. Uh, and uh, his, uh, w the reason he ended up not working out had more to do with I think his individual personal leadership style and, and nothing to do with the mission. Um, and as a general note, I'll just say like, uh, the people running the company now, uh, Amy and Tillis and, and, well, names that won't mean anything to you, but the people running the company right now have been there for more than 10 years and they're great and everyone loves them and they have really solid journalistic values. And like, as soon as Chris left, 
we were able to just focus on the journalism and not the palace intrigue and who's going to lose their job and did you see this article in Puck and all this other stuff. And that's what I want. I want the focus to be on, you know, we had a, on my show today, um, we had uh, on, I don't know if you've seen this story about the Northwestern University football coach being fired uh, because of alleged hazing. We had, a, we had a guy who was a former player on the team talking about what his experience. We had one of the amazing student journalists who helped break the story. The university had done their own investigation that didn't result in any conclusions. And then the, the daily paper came out and said, well, here are some students and like the coach lost his job. And I'm like, this is what journalism is supposed to be. These kids are awesome. And that is the purpose of journalism. And having those kids on uh, is what I love about my job. And that's what I want to be focused on. I don't want to, I, I don't begrudge you the question, but like for the last year, Everybody coming to me has been like, what is going on at CNN? What is happening at CNN? I keep reading all these articles about internal drama at CNN. I'm like, I don't want that. I well, want to it, talk. It's a good thing that you took over. And <laughs> <laughs> um, it is indeed. It is indeed. <laughs> Most people probably don't know. And I, I thought I was going to get the rap sign from Andy, but we haven't gotten it yet. Uh, most people probably don't know that, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it wasn't really until the beginning of the 20th century that mainstream journalism in this country um, developed standards of objectivity and uh, certain ethical kinds of standards. Yeah. The birth of this country, I mean, during the colonial period, all the newspapers and pamphlets were purposefully biased, either for... Uh, Hamilton's Federalists or, or uh, uh, Jefferson's Republicans. And that was the tradition of journalism in America until 1910, 1920, when all of a sudden it was the right thing to be objective. My concern today is that so many consumers of news are, are living in silos. Yes. Where, where uh, and, and they complain about bias right. in, in news except they are uh, only looking at news that coincides with how they feel or how they think. Um, and it's getting more and more and more so. My question- And it's a great business model, but it's not great journalistic My model. question to yeah. you is, the notion of um, unbiased news, Objectivity is a problem for me because I don't know how people are objective. They bring to witnessing a story all their life experiences. That's why we have diverse newsrooms. So we have different people looking at you know, stories in different ways. But the idea of unbiased news, is that becoming a quaint anachronism? Is that something that we really aren't going to have uh, at our disposal as we, as we continue into this century? I hope not because that's the only kind of news I'm comfortable giving and, and doing. But it is true that if, <laughs> was he giving, he's giving us the rap. <laughs> it is true that, um, that it is a good business model to preach to the choir. It is, it just is. And it is, um, people don't like hearing negative things about politicians they like. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's also, you know, one of the warnings uh, in the book about that kind of journalism uh, when you're not, you're, you're, you have an agenda beyond just sharing the facts and the truth. I don't buy that there's no model. For, I just don't. It's not the kind of news I consume. When there's a big news story uh, and people flock to CNN, I got to believe it's because they just want the facts about the story. We also just are well equipped to do the kind of journalism that people, you know, when, um, for instance, I, I was off, so I get no credit for this, but um, when it looked as though Russia was about to have a civil war or a revolt or a coup, um, that Saturday morning, I was on vacation, so again, I get no credit for this, but, you know, Fox was covering a trans dolphin or something, and, um, <laughs> And uh, MSNBC was showing a rerun of Scarborough. They were showing a rerun of Scarborough. And we had all of our amazing journalists in London, in, in Moscow, in Kiev. And it's just, it's what we are able to do. And um, so I, I just don't buy it. I just don't, I don't think it is 
there, you know, there are going to be nights where, you know, certainly in prime time, especially people like to put on their team jerseys and root for their side. But there are also people who just want to be informed. Um, I think a lot of people got after the Trump years, whether pro or, or con on Trump, just kind of like didn't want news anymore. They just wanted to take a breath especially after COVID, which was just hellacious for everybody. But I just think that like, ultimately it is important for there to be a place like CNN or uh, just a you know, PBS News Hour, you know, uh, people who, aren't, who don't, aren't there with agenda, who are just trying to deliver the news in as objective Jim Gardner a way as possible. I think. And, the, and the networks, by the way. Yes, I think that's true. But the, the only difference I will say is those are entertainment companies with news divisions. You're talking about news companies. I yeah, guess, and, right. and, and I will just say, as somebody who used to work at ABC News, which is how I, I got to meet you originally, like there are, there are more commercial pressures on news, news divisions and entertainment companies because those are entertainment companies, and so there is something, they, there is a different imperative. I mean, so um, it is, it's a bigger decision if there's a, big, if there's a breaking news story. To break into. To break into. Entertainment programs. Yeah, right. entertainment programs, which is, mo which is which most Which used of the to program. happen, you know, rather liberally, much less so in recent years. Right, because it's, right. Cause the markets are getting, because the, the audiences are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and so the need for the, the money uh, is, is greater and greater. So, anyway. Who has a question for Jake Tapper? Oh, boy. Uh, in all of your years of like doing journalism, journalism, what has been the craziest thing you've ever witnessed? Oh wow, <laughs> that's a really tough question because I've you know uh, I've been to I've had the good fortune of you know being to being in Afghanistan and being in Iraq and being in Ukraine and and uh, so I don't know what you mean by crazy. There's horrifying crazy and there's silly crazy and there's just, you know there's all sorts of I mean, I got to interview Larry David once. I mean, that was that was crazy. It'd been a different in a different way. You know, I interviewed. Anyway, um, I guess it, I'm just going to go with the serious crazy, which was um, being in New Orleans after the levees fell after Hurricane Katrina, and I arrived like a week later, and seeing I'm not going to get too graphic, but just seeing how incredibly like you would think after a week of this there would have been much more done to clean up the city and just like whatever do so I understand you can't get rid of all the water but the the ab abandon and the disarray that New Orleans was in a, a week after the hurricane had already passed was just very eye-opening just in terms of wow we're the greatest nation on earth and yet we're not deploying all the resources this is this is embarrassing as an American now, did you lay the blame at the feet of George W. Bush for that? No, no. I, I, I mean, I think it was, I, it was the, I, I blamed the governor, I blamed the president, I blamed FEMA. Remember that guy that was in charge of FEMA, yeah, the horse yeah. trainer or something, Michael Brown? Brown, he did a heck of a job, as they say. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just uh, an incompetence uh, all the way around, uh, starting with the Army Corps of Engineers that, that built those levees. But um, just the, f again, I, I, to really illustrate there were just still a lot of dead people all over the place. And it was just, it was just really crazy that it would, like, again, I got there like a week later. I was not on the first, you know, uh, the, the first group there. And that, that was just crazy to see. Sorry, that's, you probably wanted a more lighthearted uh, answer. But. All right, Given the uh, situation with the Wall Street Journal reporter in Russia, why, do, uh, why does CNN continue to have correspondents based in Russia? And what are the pressures dealing with, whether it's Russia or China, where journalists are locked up? It's a really good question. Um, why, why do we have a reporter in Russia, given the fact that Evan Gershkovich of the Wall Street Journal has been in prison now for uh, several months for these trumped up uh, spy charges that nobody, nobody believes? I don't even think the Russians pretend to believe them. Um, we are very careful about how we report from there, and I can't really go into any more detail than that, but it is, uh, everything is, uh, people are very careful. And we're there because uh, it's, we don't, we don't give in to terrorism. We're, we're journalists. We don't just like, it, just because this Russian, this government is gonna lock up this journalist doesn't mean we're gonna stop reporting on, uh, 
on Russia, which is obviously a, a major power player and started this war in Ukraine, continues to commit human rights abuses. And um, it's an important, I mean, it's, it's not unlike saying, why do we have anybody in Kiev or Ukraine? People are being killed there. Why, do we have, why did we have reporters in Afghanistan? Why did we have reporters in Iraq? You're shaking your head, you disagree. It's, it, we, 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 go to, we go to dangerous places. That's one of the things that journalists do is we go to dangerous places and there are risks. And um, I mean, I wouldn't advise any of you to go to Russia. Uh, I'm not saying that flippantly. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't advise it, any of you to go to any number of countries. But as journalists, a lot of times that's where the stories are. And sometimes horrible things happen. I mean, I went to... I mean, my mom and stepmom can tell you I went to Ukraine last April uh, for two weeks, and I'm sure they weren't happy about that, but I felt like there were stories that I needed to tell, and I'm really, I'm really glad I went. And we were smart while we were there, and we had security, and we took proper precautions, I think, but, but uh, that's where the story was. I got to interview Zelensky in his palace. I got to tell the story of these refugees and people who were wounded. I got to go to the hospital and inter I got to, th this, that's the job is we tell the stories of these people and we can only tell their stories if we're there to, tell, to, 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 to interview them and, and then share them with you. I just, I think it's important what we do. If you want to cover World War II in Vietnam, you've got to take some risks yeah. to get there. Uh, thank you for CNN because I think it's the only station that gives news. Thank you. Our local stations, the first 10 minutes, all three channels, all three Philadelphia stations. Since Jim left, right. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, Since Jim left. It's That's what I'm saying. It's yes. about a shooting. You can't get anything other than what is happening in shooting. They don't give you anything that's good that's happening in the city, but they seem to emphasize the shootings. So it's very nice to have CNN that we can get actual news. Well, unfortunately, uh, we cover a can lot of... Can someone escort this woman out of the way? <laughs> Thank you. No, thank you for your opinion. I heard somebody say, since you left, I heard, I mean, somebody said, <laughs> somebody said that this wasn't a problem when you were there. Um, I don't know who it was, but I definitely heard that. So um, we cover a lot of shootings, too, unfortunately. Um, ours just ha rise to, they have to be mass shootings, uh, right? The, as opposed to the one-offs uh, in Philly. But I will, I will say, crime, people care about crime. It's not just... I mean, I know the old saying, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, people say that about local news. But the truth of the matter is one's safety in one's city, one's neighborhood is important. And maybe there's too much of it, and I certainly understand that argument. But, uh, but I, 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 it is, it is an, it, it's definitely, um, people, people do care about it. That's why it, it leads, not because of the whims of, uh, anchors or news directors, it leads because people watch it because they care about it. Um, and the truth of the matter is at least uh, just to defend local news, um, uh, if it's true, it's, in, it's, it, it's important. You know, I'm, I'm more focused right now on trying to make sure that people are reporting things that are true. Um, so, but I, I hear what you're saying. I definitely do. And, uh, you know, I, I did notice that, that change after Jim left. One more, One more question. After this. Okay. this is it. So we'll close okay. it on a lighter note. On a lighter note, who was your favorite person to hang out with at Kristen Bell's birthday dinner? <laughs> oh. What was the question? <laughs> who was your favorite person to hang out with on Kristen Bell's right, so, birthday dinner? I, I don't know if you all know about this viral photograph that the amazing Kristen Bell posted. So um, it actually it was it's that's Jimmy Kimmel's fishing lodge, and and uh, my wife and kids and I have been honored and somewhat confused to be invited. Uh, <laughs> Every uh, for the last few years, it started um, after uh, it started like in uh, two years ago. So it's just like a COVID kind of thing. And um, again, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing there. But it's J you know Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, Jason Bateman, Jennifer Aniston, Courtney Cox, Dak Shepard, Kristen Bell, David Chang. Uh, uh, I mean, this, it, the list. Mark Rober from YouTube. I, I'm just the list goes on and on. And it's just this really remarkable collection of really interesting, nice people. A lot of them have kids that are the same age as my kids. So 
That's fun. Um, I can't pick a favorite other than Jimmy, who invited me, so I guess it's Jimmy Kimmel's my friend. <laughs> also, Jimmy Kimmel is one of the inspirations for the, the, All the Demons Are Here, because it was two years ago at this thing. He is the one um, that, had, that loved Evil Knievel, that at his fishing lodge has an Evil Knievel pinball machine and Evil Knievel pictures. <laughs> and I was just like, what is your deal with this guy? <laughs> and believe it or not, Johnny Knoxville was there too. And he was like, that guy is awesome. And they're the ones that told me to look into him. And like, they're, they're, they were the muses of this book. I'm impressed that there are people in this room who know who Johnny Knoxville is. There's some kids right there. Jake Tapper, thank you so much. Oh, wait. I want to show you something. No, hold on. I want to show you something. It's, 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 staying, it's staying G-rated, don't worry. But I did not buy this for this event. Hold on. I did not buy this for this event, but I did bring it for this event. And that is my... Uh... I, I already owned it. I'm on a text chain of all these Philadelphia diasporans uh, that Jim has finally agreed to, to join, or he finally learned about, whatever, and we all idolize him. It's like members of Congress and reporters, and somebody put this on the site like 10 years ago, like two years ago, and I'm like, oh my God, I gotta get myself one of these. And it says, move closer to your world, my friend. <laughs> right here. So. So. I want a picture. The problem is it's not your world that I'm close to here. <laughs> yeah, move closer to my gut, your friend, my friend. Thank you all. It's been great. And Jake Tapper, thank you.